Welcome to the Spring Fever Garden Forums, where we connect the gardeners to the experts of North Dakota State University. My name is Tom Kolb. I'm an extension horticulturist in the Department of Plant Sciences, and I'm here with Scott Swanson. He's an electronic media specialist in the Department of Agriculture Communications. This is the third of our four Spring Fever Garden Forums, and tonight our theme is healthy environment. Okay, let's learn about beneficial insects. And here to teach us is Dr. Jan Canodal. Jan is the extension entomologist at North Dakota State University. And for the past 20 years, she has provided statewide leadership in extension entomology and the North Dakota Integrated Pest Management, that's the IPM program. And she coordinates and co-edits the NDSU Crop and Pest Report. Jan's research focuses on insect pests of field crops, as well as gardens, and she also does work on pollinators. Jan, welcome to the forums. Yeah. Well, thank you, Tom, very much, and good evening. I'd like to get started and acknowledge my co-presenters, Patrick Bose and Travis Proshashka. Well, most of us, when we think about insects, we think about pests, but in reality, most of the insects are good insects. In fact, 99% of them. And that's what I'll be talking about today, natural free pest control in the garden. Of course, insects have many other benefits, pollination, which we're all familiar with. That's valued at over $40 billion in the US alone. And then uh, many other insects are decomposers. They break down leaves and other botanical nutrients and also dead bodies. Um, they'll break them down and they all become nutrients in their soil. They're used in me medical field as well. For example, we use maggots to put on burns and it actually helps heal the burns and the venom in honeybees is used in arthritic medicine. They're also important food sources for our ecosystem, birds and other organisms. But in other countries, they also eat insects like Africa and South America. So there's even bugs cookbooks now if you're interested in that. And if you wanna go on a high protein, low fat diet, Try crickets and grasshoppers. So we'll be talking about all different types of natural enemies, predators, uh, which will be some insects and non-insects, spiders and mites, parasitoids and diseases that affect insects. So first I wanted to explain the difference between predators versus parasitoids. Predators, there's very many different species and we'll go through just a small handful of them today. Parasitoids are mainly wasps and flies. Predators are generalists, meaning they'll go after whatever they find and some of them even feed on pollen, nectar and vegetation as well as insect prey. And then parasitoids are usually specialists. Some of them only attack one insect, but others will go after a whole host of them in a group of insects. Uh, predators are usually big and larger than the prey, whereas parasitoids are small. And predators, they'll be predaceous in the adult or the immature stage. Parasitoids, it's only the immature stage that will attack and kill its host. Predators, they can attack mainly the adult and immature stages. Some of them will feed on eggs, but most of them it's the adult or immature like the nymph or caterpillar. Parasitoids, they'll attack whatever stage they can find or the specific to. Some of them, like I mentioned earlier, are just egg specifics like a trichogramma wasp of the European corn borer egg. So let's get started. First, we're gonna go with the order Hemitra. Hemi means half, and that's because it has a half 
membranous wing and the other half is solid. And I have an arrow pointing to the membranous part of the wing. The minute pirate bug is very tiny as the name implies and it's black and white and it has a solid brown band going across it. The immature stage is called a nymph and they're much smaller than the adult. So it's even smaller and bright orange with red eyes and they're usually always wingless. Minute pirate bugs feed by having piercing sucking mouth parts. So it'll insert its mouth part into its host. And in the picture here, you can see it's an immature crawler stage of scale insects. And then it sucks out the juices and they'll feed on a variety of small insects, mainly mites and aphids and anything small for this little guy. Moving on, Hemitra order steel, ambush and assassin bug. The ambush bug is one of my favorites. They're very cryptic and they blend in. You often see them in the flowers and they have raptorial forelegs that you can see here and they grab their prey and then they have the piercing sucking mouth parts as well for feeding. The assassin bug is much larger. They can be up to two inches almost for the wheel bug, which is easy to identify. You can see it kind of looks like the sprockets of a wheel here on the thorax. And look at the size of that beak. So it goes after things that are bigger than it, even grasshoppers, large caterpillars, beetles, bees and wasps, flies, anything it can find. And also they can give you a nasty uh, bite if you handle them. The hemitric order again, uh, big eyed bugs. This one's pretty easy to identify, very small, only about a quarter of an inch, but they got big eyes, as you can see. And this di uh, triangle here is characteristic of the hemitra order as well. So just about all the insects I talked about are all have that characteristic that you will see in the adult stage. Nymphs are smaller again, no wings, but it still has those big eyes. And this guy is gonna feed on smaller prey. Damsel bugs. This one is generally a, less than a half an inch long and they're brown to black. The color can range depending on species. And again, they have the adult stage, that triangle in the middle of the back and the half membranous wings. And they have raptorial forelegs that grab the prey. This little aphid then is being sucked with the piercing mouth part, piercing sucking mouth parts. And again, they feed on quite a variety of prey. The predatory stink bugs. Now there's also stink bugs that are pests that feed on our plants, but there's a small, proportion of them that are good stink bugs, the predatory stink bugs. And this one's pretty common, the spined shoulder bug. Again, you can see the triangle in the back and the half member in a swing. And these are pretty large, some of them. They can be about over an inch almost. And again, the nymph is smaller, wingless, and they'll feed on smaller prey like this egg here. And you can identify the predaceous stink bugs by the beak. If you look at the base, it's very wide. On the plant feeding stink bugs, it's very narrow at the base. And they're also called stink bugs for a reason because they have glands on the side of the thorax that emit a smelly stink if you handle them. And they feed on a lot of common garden pests, Colorado potato beetle, larvae of European corn borer, diamondback moth, fall armyworm, flea beetles. So just about anything they can find. Here you can see them feeding on a plant feeding stink bug. That's the two spotted predaceous stink bug. Moving on to a new group, order Neuroptera. 
This includes the green and the brown uh, lay swing. And the, the brown lay swing is smaller, only about a half an inch, whereas the green lay swing is a little bit larger, about one inch. And the neuropta means many veins in the wings. So they're very delicate looking and they have a weak fluttery flight. So they're not one of the insects that would move long distances. But the larvae are very voracious. You can see the huge cyclical mand mandibles here. And on the inside of the mandibles, there's a little groove. And when they pinch their prey, they'll suck in that groove the juices out. And the color is kind of mottled. Usually they're brown or dark and white in color. And they have the characteristic of when they're done feeding on the like an aphid, they'll throw that aphid body over its back as a protective covering, which protects it from parasitoids. And then the eggs of the green lacewing are laid up on the stalk, usually on leaves or other plant parts. And they do that for a reason, because once that larvae hatches from the egg, it's cannibalistic. So it's going to eat all the other eggs, but being up on the stalk, they're protected. Now the brown lacewing lays its eggs singly on each leaf and other plant parts. So you won't, um, they don't lay them up on the stalk. So if you see these uh, on the stalk, it's the green lacewing. And the green lacewing likes more open fields, meadows and flower gardens. Whereas the brown lacewings is more common in wooded areas. And they're known as aphid lions, the larvae. They'll consume up to 400 aphids per week. So they're excellent at keeping aphids in check. Beetles, coleoptera, ground beetles and tiger beetles. The tiger beetle is fairly big. It's about an inch and they're beautiful colorations, all types from black to metallic green, purple. And they have very uh, long legs for running. They run in short bursts and they have large eyes to see the predators and mandibles. And the larvae you, very, you do not see unless you would dig it out of its nesting hole. The eggs are laid in these holes in sandy soil and often like along the banks of a stream. And then the a female beetle will provision it with like a caterpillar and then the larvae will hatch, feed on that. And then they attach themselves in the burrow. And when a prey comes by, they'll jump out and surprise it and capture it. And they're most common on the ground, just like the ground beetles are, the carabidae's. Uh, the variety is just amazing in the colors from this beautiful, iridescent green. You can have a black one with a metallic green and then it has real little diamond red spots. They're just gorgeous. Quite large, they can be up to over an inch. And again, they have fast running along the soil, but they will climb occasionally up onto the leaves. And the larvae also find found underneath, you know, organic matter, leaf litter and so forth in the soil. And this one here is feeding on a snail. So they're generalist predators. So they're gonna catch whatever they can find. Uh, moving on, this one's, everyone's familiar with lady beetles. You all recognize the red or orange beetle with black spots. Some of them are black with red spots. So there's a tremendous variation. Uh, the larvae you may or may not recognize. The larvae is the black and orange and then tubercles protruding from the abdomen. And the pupae I wanted to show because not everyone recognizes. I get questions every year about this. People think it's attached to the plant or the leaf. 
So it's sucking out the juices of the leaf, but that's not true. It's just transforming from the larvae to the beetle in this stage. And it's kind of, a, we call it a sessile stage because it's not non-feeding. So the development can take quite a long time, four to eight weeks depends on the species and the temperature, but they're both larvae and adult voracious aphids predators. They like scales as well, uh, thrips and mites and insects eggs. They can consume 5,000 aphids in their lifetime. And there's many different species as I alluded to. Uh, unfortunately, we have a lot of non-natives that were introduced for biological control, classical biological control of insect pests. Unfortunately, the research has shown that some of the introduced species, like the non-native here, the seven-spotted lady beetle, is displacing some of our more common native insects that are now in decline. So it's kind of sad, but it's uh, happening out there. A uh, row of beetles. This probably doesn't look like a beetle at all to you. Underneath this square wing pad is two pairs of membranous wings um, and it can fly as an adult. Uh, they're about a, an inch or smaller. Some are very small in this species. Others are quite large. You'll generally find them again on the soil. The lar uh, larvae are very predaceous as well. And they'll, they got chewing mandibles and they'll feed on whatever they can find. Some of them that are smaller feed on the smaller insects like springtails and fungus gnats and thrips and mites, tiny little mites in the soil. Okay, flies, diptera. This one is known as the flower fly or the hover fly. And it mimics a bee. You can see it's yellow and black in coloration. And it's a fly, not a bee, because it only has one pair of wings. Bees have two pairs. The larvae doesn't look like anything but a slug. And it's legless and looks like it's headless, but the head is up here. It has a retractable mandible that will pierce and suck out the juices of its prey. And the adult is actually a pollinator and it will feed on nectar and pollen of the plant. And they'll feed up to 50 aphids per day, the larvae. And then we got the predatory wasps. These are the guys you might not like, like the hornets, even though uh, they're hornets and some are solitary, uh, wasps, but they feed on a lot of different insects and mainly bigger insects. Like here, you can see it has a honeybee. Some of the non-insect predators are spiders. Again, they have eight legs. There's a whole variety of spiders. Some are only night feeders on the ground. Others like this garden spider spins a web. And again, they'll feed on good and bad bugs, but mainly bad bugs. And again, a non-insect predator is predatory mites. Uh, most, most of them or a lot of them are red and they have longer legs and they're fast moving compared to the plant feeding mites like this mite here that's feeding on the plant. And they also feed on insects, eggs, thrips and small caterpillars as well as the bad spider mites. Parasitoid wasps, here's the uh, uh, eggs, this one's an ectoparasite, meaning it's on the outside body of the uh, caterpillar. Others will lay eggs singly or in groups in the inside of the caterpillar. And others like this tiny little brocanid wasp is going to insert one egg into that aphid's body. And then that aphid's body will become a balloon because it's being eaten out from the inside from that egg that is laid inside the body. It'll cut a perfect circular hole and then you'll get a nice new wasp emerging and it'll repeat the cycle. Many are available commercially. This is trichogramma. And then we have the parasitoids in the flies, the 
conids. It kind of looks like a housefly, except if you look closely, you can see some real stout bristles and some of them are quite large up to an inch. And they lay their eggs generally in the circle here. You can see the egg laid right on the outside and then that'll go right into the body of its host. Some of them are very specific just to one group of insects like stink bugs or true bugs. And then there's the diseases. Uh, here's a fungal infected uh, aphid. You can see all the mycelial growth from the fungal disease and it eventually you know, kills that insects. But again, to get good uh, uh, infection, you need warm temperatures and high humidity. This is a viral infected caterpillar and the virals destroy the cell tissue. So it breaks down the cells and it becomes liquidified. Eventually it's gonna eat through the exoskeleton of the insect and you'll have all that goo leaking out. And that goo is filled with billions of spores that will affect many more insects. And then there's a natural occurring soil bacterium. We, we use a lot of BT, Bacillus syringensis, Dipel is the trade name. And that's used a lot for our forest tent caterpillars and other uh, caterpillars that you might have. Spinosa is another one. And what can we do to promote beneficial insects in the garden? You're probably already doing it if you have a pollinator garden you know, shelter, refuge, woodpile, mulch, and then a variety of flowers. So you got flowers all the way through the summer and then provide water and nectar sources and don't use insecticides and when you do only when necessary. And you just create your beautiful garden or yard. That's gonna help out all the natural enemies and here's an extension fact sheet that we just finished and has some of them that I mentioned in here today. It's kind of a, just an overview. It's a two page handout that is available. And also there's many other resources out there. I would encourage you to go to the Xerce Society. They have some excellent fact sheets and books. Some of them are free, just download them as a PDF, Cornell University has a whole guide online that you can spend in many pictures. And thank you very much. I hope that I'm done on time. <laughs> and here's some pictures from my garden. It looks quite a bit different. This was taken at the beginning. Now it's a lot more filled in. Looks great, Jan. And thanks for the presentation right on time. You're a veteran, you're a professional at this all the way. <laughs> So now we have time for questions and we've got a few coming in. First of all, Jan, when are lady beetles most active at feeding? Uh, well, there's so many different species of lady beetles. It's uh, kind of hard to answer, but I did quickly go over the biology. You know, it takes anywhere from four to eight weeks to go through development. So you're gonna have multiple generations. So to have lady beetles be attracted, you have to have, you know, the host or their prey. And aphids is the most popular, scale insects, thrips, uh, generally the smaller um, insects, small caterpillars, eggs. So they, they'll they come in after the pests are there. But they've, um, I do a lot of research on soybean aphid, which is a key pest of soybean. And I, they've ruined many of my insecticide trials because the lady beetles especially come in in large numbers and they'll eat and keep the numbers of uh, soybean aphid below the threshold. So um, yeah, it, it varies. It usually takes some uh, little well to get going. Um, so when you first see the aphids, they may not be there, but it, they'll be there in a couple of weeks. So they you have know, are, to find Is there them. warfare at night or is it only daytime warfare? Are they morning feeders? I know they're, or? you'll see them during the day as well. All the time to go after them. Yeah. 
just because because they got to eat five thousand aphids. You only have so much time, so yes, <laughs> you must always be munching, well, munching some... or having sex. I think because yeah. there's always aphids around. I think. Or actually, well, they don't. Have, I, they don't even well, have to have sex, right? They can. Yeah, the the uh, aphids that you see in the summer are mainly all females, and they give birth through the process of parthenogenesis. So that's uh, reproduction um, internally. They give birth to live young. So, and their live young are all females. So within seven days, those uh, young that were born are able to reproduce. So you have an exponential wow. reproductive growth rate with the aphids. And there's no male males needed. Males are not produced usually <laughs> typically until the fall where then they go through the <laughs> sexual reproduction. But during the summer, it's asexual reproduction. Okay, let's get back on track. I, I sidetracked there a little bit. How about a BT? What is the shelf life of BT? Um, I've had, well, it should say on the label. So read the label. Um, and you generally you want to store it at room temperature where it's not going to be exposed to, you know, a 90 degree weather or, or sunlight because it breaks down readily with sunlight. So a lot of BTs now have a sunscreen in them to help them last longer out in the field. But yeah, so um, I've had some that was two years old and the key to controlling caterpillars and other soft-bodied insects with the BT is time of spraying. You want to get it on when the they're young caterpillars, less than a half an inch long, because they have to ingest it, and then the BT breaks down the gut and it essentially ruptures the gut, killing the insect. That's a lot of cool destruction you talked in your talk to about how the insects balloon and explode and all that yeah. leak, leak guts and all that other good stuff. How about the uh, spotted wing drosophila? Are there any biocontrols for that? I know they've used spinosad um, and they're working on biological control of the spotted wing drosophila. And then I also heard they're working on sterilization of males and doing massive release of sterilized males. Okay, to, that's good. Yeah, so there's a lot in the works now. Um, I guess Minnesota's doing some work now on that. Okay. How about in the vegetable garden, is it okay to leave spiders alone or should we destroy them too? No, definitely leave them alone. Um, they're very good predators of most all of our pests. And yeah, you know, Jan, you're so easy going. Like you said, like 99% of insects are beneficial, even like hornets and like, yeah. what's a bad insect to you? What's a non-beneficial insect? Well, something that like a flea, a lice. <laughs> <laughs> okay. ticks, just... ticks aren't insects, but I do not like ticks. Okay. Um... Mosquitoes. All right. How about uh, many insect pests such as apple maggots spend the winter in the soil? Are there any biocontrols that can reduce the overwintering, the sort of survival rate? I'm trying to think now. Um, there is, I can't think of anything you could apply. There is nematodes available, but they're more for white grubs things that are longer lived in the soil so the nematodes can find them. And then even then applying a nematode doesn't always guarantee control because you need moist soils. They need moist soils to move to find the prey. So if it's too dry, they'll be ineffective and, and they have a short life um, as well. So you need to get them the year you're gonna use them. Yeah, I think they can just use some traps, hang them up in the apple yeah, trees. Traps. And, yeah, those and red monitor ball traps for them. Yeah. is the best to monitor for apple maggot. How about uh, do native generalist predatory bugs eat the non-native bugs like lily beetles? Do the native predators eat non-natives? 
Uh, yes, yeah. The, most of the predators are generalists, so they don't discriminate whether you're, you know, originally from Europe or <laughs> Asia and introduced to the U.S. Um, if you're, you know, smaller than they are, they're gonna probably eat you. Okay. And they're cool. hungry. <laughs> 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 okay, any uh, organic control for Japanese beetle? Well, yeah, we are concerned with Japanese beetle. Um, there is um, not, it's not labeled for use in North Dakota, unfortunately, but there is a, uh, it's like a bacteria, a BT, but it's specific to beetles. Um, that is available, but it's not labeled. I don't believe it's labeled in North Dakota. How about the spinel's head? Get Japanese beetles? Yeah, yes, it would. Yeah. Okay. It works on flea beetles as well. But the thing with many of the microbial insecticides is they have a shorter uh, lifespan out in the field because they get broken down. Uh, it's natural, so they get broken down easier than a synthetic insecticide. So you have to reapply them, you know, more often. How about any or, uh, biocontrols for potato beetles, the Colorado potato beetle? There, um, yes, there are many predators out there as well. There's some that specialize on Colorado potato beetles and their parasitic wasps as well uh, that attack them. In terms of fungal diseases, I think you there is some fungal sprays yeah. you could spray, but I have to look up what they are. Yeah, I think you know spinosad, isn't that a that's yeah, I, I know if I'm that pronouncing one that works. right. Yeah, that's yes. uh, common for Colorado potato beetle now. Yeah. Um okay. Okay, would you because can potato beetles uh, how are easy going on are they, are, there any, are they doing anything good? In this world, or are they another? Are they a bad bug? A Colorado potato know, beetle? Yeah, they're they're Colorado potato beetles on notorious pests, and in commercial potato fields, they they've developed resistant to so many insecticides, so they've been very difficult for commercial fields, you know, to control them, and they're always yeah. adapting to new modes of action. Where barely one step ahead of them and there's nothing good about a colorado potato beetle you can kill no. them with pleasure and don't feel guilty about it yeah <laughs> how about here's a mystery question there's an insect that eats holes in the plastic edging around a garden it eats holes in the pvc pipes on the sprinkler system and it eats holes in plastic water hoses it looks like someone took a drill and drilled holes in them hmm. Well, I don't know for sure that that would be an insect. Many insects can chew through plastic, I know, but I don't think PCV pipe. Okay, um, we'll so just... the plastic could be um, anything almost that has chewing mouth parts. Yeah, I have no idea. We'd have to see the insect for that. <laughs> yes, I recommend you scout and look yeah. and scout at night and just watch it see what it is okay uh how do you keep wasps from bothering you when you're eating outside well in the i'm assuming you're talking about hornets mainly yeah. they're attracted to sweet um drinks anything with sugar and also meats they like a lot so and they get mainly during the fall uh they get more aggressive uh, they're providing for a hot, a large hive. They're a social wasp, so they nest in large nests that has thousands and thousands of individuals by the end of the summer. So they get quite aggressive and searching for food for their nest. And they know they're going to die too, so they're mad. Yeah. <laughs> At the end of the summer, all the wasps <laughs> will die, except for the queen, which is fertilized. And she leaves the nest and all the larvae that are immature in the nest will not finish their development. And then she goes to overwinter under the bark of trees. Now, doesn't the mother queen, 
she stays with the group and dies with her daughters, right? And she has new queen. She makes new queens and and uh, princes to to leave, but doesn't the old well, mother stay there till the end? Uh, yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. It's the new new ones that emerge. Yeah. That we thought that's kind of romantic, almost like yeah. she stays. It's a family. <laughs> they stay together till the end. Yes. And uh, all the daughters and the mother stay there, freezing to death one night. And, I always reminds you of the Titanic going down and you know it's coming and just yeah, hold so, hands and die together. Yeah, I usually recommend um, if you have a nest that's not like right by a door where you're going in and out all the time, but in a tree, just wait until a real hard frost and then remove it because yeah. then you can be assured they're all dead. And yep. that's cool. How about what's the approximate date that they can clean up perennials in the spring, but still allow insects time to hatch and leave the overwintering insects to leave? Hmm. Oh, that's kind of a hard question because yeah. it varies. Like this year, it's really a early spring and I've seen bees and a lot of spiders and a lot of insects out already. They're already out, huh? Yeah. So what I usually do is, um, cause I need to get in early cause I work full time and I only have so much time <laughs> on the weekend. So I just throw anything I cut and remove out of my beds on the pile to mulch. Um, and then they'll emerge there. Okay, last question. Oh, this is one I know, this is an easy one for you. This person's growing cabbages and they see these little white moths flying around. Yeah, cabbage and moth. Do you, yeah, do you have any, how can we control that? Uh, well, the moth is a, a pollinator. Uh, they don't do any feeding, but they will lay eggs on your cabbage and then they hatch into the uh, uh, caterpillar, which does like to feed and create holes on the leaves of the cabbage. Um, they're heavily parasitized. Uh, by wasp so um, but a lot of times that when they're parasitized a lot of times they'll still continue to feed for a little bit before they die so you might not want to wait that long and have holes <laughs> in your cabbage so use the uh, bt dipel but make sure you apply it when it's they're young caterpillars once they mature they're done eating and it's too late. So as soon as you see those dancing moths on the top of your cabbage. The tiny little, make sure you get them when they're small. Yeah, yeah. That Half an great. inch or less. Uh, they're green, kind of velvety, so they blend in. You gotta look closely. And the BT is, is safe for humans, so there's really yes. no concerns there. Yeah, you, I wear gloves. Um, it's safe for birds and other mammals. Okay, sounds good. Chan, thank you for teaching us about all these beneficial insects. Mm -hmm.